Good afternoon, and um, thank you so much uh, to invite me to give this presentation. Uh, very special thanks to the organizer of the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation. So today I will give you a presentation on the role of the neoadjuvant and induction treatment for biliary tract cancer. So why do we need this? Um, uh, well, there is a big need. I give you a quick overview. Um, so what have we done so far? Uh, why is it difficult to treat uh, in this setting? And what is available as treatments? And I will give you also some future perspectives. So the need for induction therapy for biliary tract cancer. As you might know, the biliary tract cancer can be divided in three types, depending on the location of the disease. The perihilar cholangic carcinoma is the biggest group, which is located just outside the liver. And also there is the intrahepatic and distal carcinoma, cholangic carcinoma. Um, so to give you a, a introduction to this, I will use an example. And that example is the perihilar cholangic carcinoma. Um, so in the Netherlands, uh, what we've seen is that about 240 patients per year are diagnosed with this disease. Um, unfortunately, only resection is uh, the way to cure a patient. Um, and only 20% uh, of those patients are eligible for resection. Uh, for all other patients uh, with advanced disease, standard therapy is gemcitabine and cisplatinum. That gives a five-year overall survival for patients after uh, the radical resection of 60% and only 30% when you have uh, advanced disease. Well, of course, you can imagine that then what we would like to do is increase the patients who will undergo resection. So the question is then, is there a chance to downstage patients? At our center, we had a look at the, uh, the last years and we saw that 24% uh, had locally advanced disease um, and 40% of those are fit for chemotherapy. Um, if you look at how they respond to treatment, if you look at patients who had at least three cycles, then the resist, so the radiological uh, evaluation showed that there was 80% stable disease or partial response, and 25% of those patients qualified for a resection. But what are the downsides of downstaging? So what are the problems of downstaging? Well, first of all, we need to have the correct diagnosis. Uh, Cholangic carcinoma and the perihilar region is usually a small uh, disease which is difficult to biopsy. And uh, usually in a neoadjuvant setting, patients are undergoing endoscopy, ERCP, and some samples are taken via brush. Uh, but usually, <clears throat> uh, in a lot of cases, it's insufficient to tell the right diagnosis. And to make it even worse, uh, if you look at all patients who have undergone on a suspicion of uh, that disease, a resection, it seems that 15% of those patients had a benign disease, but they had undergone a tremendous operation, which has a high complication uh, frequency. So it is, has a 14% mortality rate. So it needs to be, uh, the diagnosis needs to be correct. But not only that the pathologist has difficulty to uh, see the right diagnosis, but also on uh, imaging like a CT scan, it's difficult to judge how advanced disease is. Uh, is it locally advanced uh, or only some fibrosis around the disease? And that fibrosis is very important because it's associated with this disease. As shown here on the left side, you see uh, in the center the cancer cells um, surrounded in the uh, normal tissue, but there is a, a, a cancer-mediated stromal reprogramming, and that shows that some fibrosis cells will be uh, produced around the cancer cells, shown here in yellow, and therefore on the CT scan it's difficult to judge uh, what is a vital cancer cell and what is just some uh, fibrosis. So what is the goal of downstaging? Of course, to increase the resection rate and therefore increase the 
chance of radical resection. And that uh, way you can increase the chance of cure, which is the ultimate goal. The other side of downstaging, so induction therapy, is that you get a test of time. Um, some diseases are terrible and are uh, metastasizing very quickly uh, to prevent those patients from unnecessary resection with all the complications. That is a way to test the time, but also to test the treatment if the treatment is efficient, efficient enough. That has been shown in other cancers like breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. So what has been done so far, um, there are in the setting of induction or neoadjuvant setting for biliary tract cancer, there have been case series published and systematic reviews, but it also has been in, uh, included into guidelines um, uh, on a national and international level, like in Europe and America. To give you an overview of the most important case series, uh, here you see uh, 10 uh, publications, mainly from th South Korea, Japan, France, and USA. Um, the amount of patients been treated is small, uh, up to 74 patients. And the patients uh, have undergone mainly gemcitabine-based uh, treatment, but also 5-FU-based treatment. And radiotherapy has been added in half of the cases. A summary of the results of those cases are that um, patients have had, 25% of those patients had received systemic induction therapy. 40% uh, of those underwent a resection and 23% of those had a radical resection. So these data are very, uh, very much the same as we've seen in our center. So why is it difficult to treat these patients? So why it's not done more often these days? Well, a lot of patients uh, with that location have a bile duct obstruction with all the complications, uh, such as infections. And infections are a threat in combination with chemotherapy. So what is the arsenal we have next to the ones we, uh, I've just shown you? So what are candidates for induction therapy? The most uh, uh, important, of course, is the standard therapy for advanced disease, gemcitabine and cisplatin. It has the highest uh, response rate, um, it is well tolerated and it well established. But as an, uh, an induction treatment or neoadjuvant treatment has been not been proven as yet in a randomized controlled trial, it has not been performed as yet. Fulfirinox has been a treatment or a combination which is uh, commonly used in pancreatic cancer, a disease very, uh, very similar to cholangiocarcinoma. And there is uh, a lot of uh, experience, uh, but not on this disease. Um, and it seems to have an influence on the fibrosis. It has only been uh, performed in some case series um, uh, and small studies in advanced disease. Uh, and of course, there's no option for this treatment if there is a bile duct obstruction, um, because RNRT can, um, cannot be given if the bilirubin is too high. It's also a much more uh, toxic uh, regimen. The other regimen is chemoradiation. Um, it seems to have a, a better local uh, uh, control rate, but it's uh, also more toxic. Uh, but there is no clear increase in response rate. A uh, much more difficult treatment option is photodynamic therapy. Um, and there have been some very interesting data from uh, um, series uh, in advanced disease, but it seems to be much more toxic uh, uh, and it, it needs a very uh, experienced group uh, to test uh, this treatment. Targeted treatment is a very promising thing for many other cancers. Uh, that way you can individualize um, um, the treatment. Uh, but as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to find enough material to sequence it to get a good target uh, measurement. Um, so what other uh, future perspectives do we have? Um, there are some ongoing trials and uh, planned trials. 
So to start with um, a promising one, which is performed right now in South Korea, uh, that's for biliary tract cancer. They have gemcitabine and cisplatinum um, in a phase two study compared to gemcitabine and cisplatinum plus durvalumab, an immunotherapy agent, which has also been uh, um, used in a clinical trial in advanced disease. Another trial uh, in Germany, a phase three trial in gallbladder cancer. Uh, they use also the backbone gemcitabine and cisplatinum, and they uh, compare uh, upfront resection versus chemotherapy followed by resection. The, in the UK, the BBC01 study has the same design, but for biliary tract cancer, and again, the same design in the Netherlands, uh, the IMPACA uh, trial, also for the broad biliary tract cancer. So there are some ongoing trials, and all of them use gemcitabine cisplatinum. So the future perspectives, they're fortunately ongoing clinical trials. Uh, I will summarize those which I found so far. Um, the first one is a, a trial on biliary tract cancer, phase two in South Korea, using gemcitabine cisplatinum uh, plus or minus, minus durvalumab, which is immunotherapy. Um, the uh, second trial is a phase three trial on gallbladder cancer. Uh, they also use gemcitabine and cisplatinum and they compare resection versus chemotherapy followed by resection. Another one is a, a study in the UK, the BBC01 study. It's a phase two study in the same setting, neoadjuvant, but in all biliary tract cancers using also gemcitabine and cisplatinum. And the design is, again is resection versus chemotherapy followed by resection. And the same design used in the IMPECA trial in the Netherlands. So what else is promising? Um, the combination treatment of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, but that, that is still ongoing in the advanced uh, disease. Um, treatment based on tumor DNA mutation or amplification that has been shown in uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma where FGFR uh, amplification has been present. Um, so what, what do we need, need more to use as a neoadjuvant treatment? We need more local uh, material to harvest. So a better way to harvest material to sequence cancer cells. And we need positive studies in the advanced disease to be able to use those in the neoadjuvant setting. So to conclude my presentation, I hope I have been convincing to show you that induction treatment is a promising treatment for a subgroup of patients with a biliary tract cancer. I would like to conclude my presentation to thank, of course, all the patients who have been able to uh, collect those data and to particip participate in clinical trials to get more information, and also the Dutch uh, community, the Dutch uh, Working Party, BHCG, um, and uh, the international groups like the ENSCA, the Eurocan, uh, but also the patient uh, groups like uh, the Cholangia Carcinoma Foundation, the AMF in Great Britain, and the Dutch NFK, the National Federation of Cancer Organizations. Thank you to the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to talk to you about this subject that is very near and dear to my heart. What's on the horizon for all comer studies? As a doctor who focuses on cholangiocarcinoma, I meet a lot of patients. I have been so excited to see the development of molecular profiling, which can identify targets for treatment. We are thrilled when we find an FGFR fusion or some other targetable, targetable alteration. But despite the high rates of actionable alterations in this disease, relative to others, there are still a lot of patients, the majority in fact, for whom we cannot find a specific drug. It is imperative that we continue to support all comer studies. This beautiful slide was presented last year at this meeting by Dr. Goyle. We generally think of systemic therapy as falling into three buckets 
immunotherapy, which acts on the immune system after, rather than uh, directly on a tumor cell, targeted therapy, which acts only on targets in the cancer, and chemotherapy, which acts more broadly, but works rel on relatively more on the cancer than on normal cells. For all comers, optimizing chemotherapy is essential. Because of the promising results of a phase two trial of the combination of gemcitabine, cisplatin, and nab paclitaxel, resulting in conversion to resectable disease and pathologic complete response for some patients, the phase three study, SWOG 1815, is rapidly accruing around the country to compare the so-called GAP regimen to standard gemcis. Other more modern aggressive regimens are also being explored. Fulfurinox did demonstrate a response rate of 10% after GEMSYS. While this is modest, remember that Fulfox in this scenario yielded a 5% response rate. Prodige 38 is designed to compare Fulfurinox to GEMSYS in the frontline setting. Not designed for comparison, the KNIFE study will look at the role of NAL arenatecan uh, with 5-FU and leucovorin in the frontline setting. Recently at ASCO this year, a study was presented in which Fulfury was explored alongside Fulfox in the refractory setting and looked very similar in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival. So what about new targets? Um, Nedilation is a post-translational modification that is overactive in multiple cancers. Proteins that are nedilated are degraded rather than functioning in essential functions like DNA repair, autophagy, and apoptosis. Pevanetostat is a nedilation inhibitor and was tested in a phase one study in combination with carboplatin and paclitaxel. Two patients with cholangiocarcinoma treated with the combination had partial responses. This provides the basis for the ecog Akron study 2187, led by my colleague Dustin Deming, a randomized phase two study of this combination compared to pevanetostat alone. Other novel targets which may have broad application include opagabinib, a sphingosphene kinase two inhibitor. Um, SK2 catalyzes the formation of the lipid signaling molecule S1P, which can promote cancer growth, motility, survival, transformation, and inflammation. Dr. Borad leads a study of the combination of GEMSYS with slim assertive, which inhibits CK2, which is upstream of PI3 kinase, JAK-STAT, and NF-kappa-B. And Dr. Sahai is investigating Devimistat, which is a mitochondrial TCA cycle inhibitor in combination with chemotherapy. Immunotherapy remains one of the most promising areas of cancer research. Our goal would be to extend the remarkable benefits of immunotherapy from the very few to all comers. In some patients with cholangiocarcinoma, there have been excellent responses, but overall the activity of single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors remain very low. So as a community, we're trying to find out how to make a cold tumor hot. In general, cholangiocarcinoma seems to be a cold tumor. Theories about how to make a cold tumor hot include finding ways to encourage CD8 positive T cell infiltration. Two ways to potentially do that are to stimulate with GM-CSF or to use MEK inhibition. Dr. Kelly has presented the intriguing early data with pembrolizumab plus GMCSF. Overall response rate was 19%, significantly higher than the 5% seen with pembrolizumab alone. And more recently, Dr. Art Yarchwan and Dr. Azad led a study of the MEK inhibitor cobimetinib with atezolizumab. This trial was notable in that it accrued 80 patients in 10 months months, highlighting the need for more all-comer studies. While response rates remain modest, there was a hint of improved progression-free survival with the combination. 
The improvement in PFS seemed to be driven by intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and the combination did show increased CD8 and FOXP3 ratio by immunohistochemistry, suggesting some immune mod modulation. Other ways uh, to uh, enhance immunotherapy include exposing neoantigens with either chemotherapy or PARP inhibition, or targeting complementary pathways. Recently, Dr. Sahai presented at ASCO the results of an initial look at the most well-studied immunotherapy combination, ipilimumab and nivolumab. Unfortunately, ipinevo seemed to be inferior to gemsys, and moreover, nivolumab did not add to gemsys when looking at all at historical controls. Finally, when thinking about all comers, it is worth considering additional trial models. We are participating in this study led by Dr. Sahai, which explores the role of early intervention with nivolumab and rucaparib in patients who have not progressed after first-line platinum therapy. If the immune system needs time to get activated, early intervention may be beneficial. So with regards to systemic therapy for all comers, we hope to add more agents to each of these buckets. We really have not determined how best to utilize immunotherapy for most patients with cholangiocarcinoma, but hope that agents such as checkpoint blockade, adoptive T-cell therapy, and CAR T-cells may be directions we can go. Targeted therapy, although traditionally thought of with targets such as FGFR inhibitors and IDH1 mutations, may include new targets such as nettilation, PARP inhibition, and others. And still, chemotherapy remains a mainstay for investigation for all comers, and hopefully more modern regimens may lead to better outcomes. So in conclusion, high rates of actionable alterations still leave many patients without targeted therapy. Even patients with actionable alterations will likely need additional treatment options. And although biliary cancers are rare, all comer studies accrue very quickly. Many exciting targets are under investigation for these patients. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Eugene Coy. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology in MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today um, and share with you some cutting edge multidisciplinary trials in radiation oncology, as well as, you know, from the interventional radiology side. Um, I am a radiation oncologist by training. Um, I work very closely with our interventional radiology um, you know, colleagues, and I hope that I represent their modality um, you know, well today. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, you know, I have some sponsored research, um, you know, one of which I will speak to, you know, that being uh, ELECTA, uh, but I'll try to you know, maintain some fair balance whenever it comes to discussion with that. So the clinical problem with cholangiocarcinoma, as many of you know, is that you know, the, rising, the, the rising death rates um, or incidence of the disease, along with other, you know, deadly diseases in the upper GI tract from the pancreas, as well as other liver cancers, um, you know, is, is very dismal still. Um, the prognosis is, you know, that, you know, most patients are not going to be alive past five years from the diagnosis of the disease, and few are eligible for curative surgeries. Um, and this is projected to be among, you know, the top three cancer killers within the next decade. Um, new approaches are needed, and, you know, we think that you know, what we have to offer from radiation oncology as well as from interventional radiology um, will hopefully help to improve those outcomes for patients. As many of you already know, you know, from many of the other discussions that have been going on during the conference, um, the molecular classification of cholangiocarcinoma has made, been a major boon, you know, to the advancement of the science as well as the clinical treatment of patients these days. Um, you know, one of the most important studies that came out and many subsequent ones after, you know, described how you know, the, um, you know, the, the uh, molecular aspects and some of the other multi-omic aspects of cholangiocarcinoma can be used to help us to classify and group patients into different, um, you know, uh, groupings that allow us to look at, you know, specific targeted agents for those classes of disease. And this really opens up new frontiers 
uh, for radiation therapy, whether it's with external beam radiation, which is what I do as a radiation oncologist, or with the yttrium 90 or Y90, uh, which is something that either a radiation oncologist or interventional radiologists can deliver for patients. So what I'm going to go over today is, you know, three separate issues um, or topics. Um, first of all, you know, answer how does radiation work, whether that's given through external beam radiation or with interventional radiology, you know, through the use of Y90, which is more like internal radiation. Um, we'll talk about the clinical results that, you know, have been published to date for both external beam radiation and radioembolization with Y90, and then finish with novel trials and concepts and discuss where we can go in the future. So first of all, how does radiation work? Um, I, I want to first acknowledge Matt Landry, who's a very talented artist um, and, and works within the radiation department at MD Anderson. And he, he, he made this be very beautiful picture showing and depicting, you know, an external beam radiation, you know, and, you know, following through the DNA structure of, you know, a cancer molecule and breaking it apart. You know, it's a very nice illustration that kind of communicates how classic radiation biology works. The first way that we know that radiation, you know, helps to kill cancer is primarily through double-stranded DNA breaks. Whenever the DNA breaks like that, with double, both strands of the DNA strand, you know, breaking apart, whenever you reach a certain threshold of that DNA breakage, um, the, the cancer cell and other cells for that matter, um, whether they're healthy or cancerous, um, are not able to survive and they go into a death spiral. So that's the primary way that radiation therapy works, whether that's through external beam radiation or with internal radiation with Y90. Um, there's other secondary effects and other things that the radiation may um, cause. They can cause free radicals, which are very reactive molecules to bind onto the DNA and also cause DNA damage. Um, it can also lead to other bystander effects you know, that alter things like the cell cycle, chromatin, structure, which is, you know, the way that the DNA is stored, um, the nuclei structure of the cancer cells or the normal cells. Um, it affects growth factor um, production, cell junctions, you know, how the cells, you know, adhere to each other. Um, protein expression is also affected by radiation. Um, and then finally, the immune system is one of the other things that is very sensitive to radiation and its effects on cancer. There are many, many other things that um, are, have been biologically described as far as what radiation may cause whenever you give her that, you're giving that to a patient with cancer, whether it's cholangiocarcinoma or otherwise. So these are how some of the mechanisms that we know that radiation works by to kill cancer cells. And one of the forefront areas that is of keen interest to myself as well as many others in the um, community is the interaction between radiation therapy and the immune system. Uh, this is just one example of a review paper that's been published that shows you know, how radiation affects directly on the cancer cell as shown in the very middle of this um, uh, uh, figure, but it also has secondary effects on the lymphatic system shown at the very bottom, as well as individual types of, um, of immune cells such as macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, um, and others. There's also something called the abscopal effect, and this is where you can give radiation and see a response in a lesion that was not radiated because the immune system is now primed, um, you know, theoretically to go after those distant um, you know, tumors that are not radiated because now the immune system is alerted to the presence of those um, tumor cells in that distant organ. So this is something you know that has gained a lot of interest in recent years, um, and abscopal effects are fairly rare um, to begin with. But there may be ways that we can prime the system to increase the likelihood of that happening and help patients with more advanced disease. So this is an area that we'll speak to um, towards the end whenever I talk about some of the clinical trials that are ongoing or plans. So. Talking about you know the very specific technological details about how radiation works. So there's both the biology part of the radiation and how it actually affects you know cell kill um, at the molecular level in terms of DNA breakage and other secondary bystander effects. But then there's the technological piece of this, which I want to kind of speak to today um, and explain how 
these technologies enable precision radiation therapy, whether it's with external beam radiation um, that the radiation oncologists do, or with yttrium 90, uh, Y90 that the uh, interventional radiologists do. So the key technologies that allow high doses of external beam radiation be, to be delivered are, um, you know, I think of them as fourfold. <clears throat> One of them is highly conformal therapy. You know, that can include intensity modulated radiation, which means that you have multiple beams coming in from different angles around the patient, around that tumor for that patient. Um, and where those beams, um, you know, overlap is where the high dose region will um, occur um, and help to kill the, the cancer. Uh, protons is another type of radiation that can be delivered very similarly, except that these protons are charged particle, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, and they have the physical property of stopping after they've gone through a certain depth of tissue. Stereotactic ablative radiation therapy is another type of radiation delivery technique that allows you to give very high doses in very short intervals of time uh, for patients and, you know, is another, you know, technique of giving very formal radiation. And it's very related to intensity modulated radiation therapy and could also be applied in the case of protons. So it's just another technique of delivering radiation at very high doses per fraction. The liver is right below the diaphragm. And whenever a patient is breathing during the beam on, beam on time during radiation therapy, um, you can have a moving target that moves up and down with the respiratory cycle. So to give these high doses of radiation therapy safely, you have to make sure that you keep track of where the patient is in his or her breathing cycle or use a way to minimize that motion, whether by breath hold or by you know compressing the belly and you know preventing it from moving too much while the patient's breathing. So respiratory management techniques are very important because of the fact that the liver is moving while the patient's breathing. Another important technique or technology that's incorporated into giving these high doses of radiation is onboard imaging. So you have to be able to track where that tumor is on a given day whenever you're delivering these high doses of radiation because typically external beam radiation is given over the course of multiple days. And so from a day-to-day -day setup, there may be variations in how the patient is breathing, holding his or her breath, or because of gas patterns within the bowels that surround the liver, you know, those things may also affect how the lineup and where those you know, high dose beams are, um, are aiming. So that's another aspect of the technology that enables high doses of radiation to be delivered safely because you can verify where you're actually aiming the beam and that the internal anatomy is consistent with how you originally planned the radiation to be delivered. Functional and quantitative imaging is also beginning to become something that's incorporated and I'll speak to that uh, towards the end of the presentation. So these are some uh, examples of highly conformal radiation treatments with either protons on the left or IMRT on the right for patients with large liver tumors. Um, both of these patients had uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and we delivered ultra-high doses to both of these patients. Uh, 100 gray and 25 fractions, 67.5 gray and 15 fractions are kind of typical radiation doses that we have um, you know, put forward at, from the MD Anderson group and then has been adopted by multiple other groups now. This is, you know, a schematic of what a really high dose of radiation looks like. Um, so, you know, in this case, 100 gray and 25 fractions. Um, what we're trying to do is give a very high dose of radiation concentrated on the areas of the tumor that we can deliver that safely. Um, and just shown, pictured in the right side is a schematic of an organ at risk, such as the stomach. So that's shaded in, um, in, in, in beige right there. And then we create this planning risk volume, or PRV, that creates a buffer zone that does not allow any really high doses of radiation, the 75 gray or 100 gray in 25 fractions to go near the stomach. And what we have is then a, a dose gradient from the ultra high doses of radiation to a safe dose that we know that the organ at risk like the stomach um, can, can tolerate. So by having that dose gradient and allowing us to conform, you know, the really ultra high doses away from these organs at risk, uh, we can deliver most of the um, radiation dose to the area that we need to and still respect organ tolerances for external beam radiation and prevent you know, complications for the patient thereby. So these are some of the pictures that we use during the setup for the patients. Um, this is just an example of how we do it at MD Anderson. Um, however, there are many other um, you know, technologies and other ways of doing this. So I'll just mention that. 
In our case, what we use um, is what we call the Varian RPM system. So it's a respiratory management system that allows you to put a infrared reflector on the belly of the patient and has a camera at the end that um, tracks the movement of the belly of the patient while they're breathing. We immobilize the patient with a cradle as shown in the blue, and so they can see their movement of their respiratory um, you know, a cycle whenever the infrared reflector moves up and down and is tracked by the camera and they're wearing goggles or have a video production projection to see that movement. Um, they're also given a area to um, hold their breath and by having that, you know, target to hold their breath, if we're using a breathful technique, that ensures that they're holding their breath in a consistent way from one day to the next for the radiation therapy. This is an example of the onboard imaging that we use. So here we have a CT on rails. This is a diagnostic grade CT scanner that allows us to see all the internal anatomy and picture that before we actually turn on the radiation um, beam, you know, picture it on the right-hand side of the room. So that allows us to put the patient in the same treatment position as they did at the time of the simulation that I showed on the previous slide. And within the same treatment room, you know, be able to swing the patient from one side of the room to the other to be able to verify that they're in the correct position and that we're hitting the right target on a daily basis. This is an example of what that image guidance looks like. So on the left-hand side of the screen is what the daily image guidance looks like. And on the right-hand side is the simulation scan that we did with contrast to allow us to see the tumor. And we can superimpose the radiation um, uh, beams and the isodose lines uh, for the radiation uh, to see how that dose distribution looks like compared from the daily scan to the um, simulation scan and ensure that we're hitting the right area. So that's how external beam radiation is delivered. Um, as far as Y90 radioembolization is concerned, um, this is a schematic just showing what that looks like. So the interventional radiologist um, uses the catheter system to go through the aorta and then um, you know, uh, you know, selectively goes into the hepatic artery and then maybe even goes farther than the hepatic artery into one of its branches to be able to selectively deliver uh, um, you know, the, the Y90 um, uh, radioembolization to the tumor. So they do this um, you know, in a very um, you know, uh, image-guided way as well, and they're taking pictures as they go along to ensure that they're in the right areas. So on the next slide, I have a picture of what that looks like. They're doing what's called an angiogram to be able to see you know, a, a very circular tumor, as you can see kind of in the top, uh, left of this um, you know, particular image, you kind of see a ball-like structure and that's the patient's tumor. And you can see that there's the catheter coming up kind of centrally along the spine of the patient, you know, into the hepatic artery and one of the feeding vessels that feeds that large tumor. So that angiogram is an important part of the procedure planning to ensure that they understand the um, mode of delivery for those, um, that tumor and where they need to um, inject the, the therapy. Now, they also do a very important uh, TC99M MAA study. So technetium 99 m is a radio tracer that allows them to see not only you know, the dose distribution within the tumor, but they also can calculate the tumor to non-tumor ratio of uptake of the, um, the tracer. And that's kind of a surrogate for how much perfusion you have for that patient's tumor. They can also assess how much of that technetium 99 m goes to the lungs because that's the next place that the blood supply can go. And if you deliver a high dose of radiation to just the lungs because of a shunt, you know, a lot of these tumors can um, you know, have an artery and then can directly connect it to a vein. And then, then that can lead back up to the um, cardiopulmonary system and be very um, hazardous to the patient. So calculating that shunting of a particular tumor is another thing that they do with this MAA study. And then finally, they can evaluate whether there's any extra hepatic uh, blood flow that's coming from other visceral organs. So sometimes other organs you know, um, can contribute to the, um, the tumor and feed that tumor, um, or you know, there may be other directions that the, um, the blood flows and you know, the, the therapy may not necessarily go where you want it to. So this is all the things that they assess during the procedure planning. And one of the things that they can also do these days um, in certain select centers where they're developing this is to actually calculate the actual dose that they may be able to achieve um, you know, calling, using something called dosimetry. So dosimetry is a way to actually plan and calculate how much dose you're actually gonna to deliver to a patient's tumor. Um, this is not yet standardized, but it is something that's growing and there's growing evidence 
that by doing this you know, calculation of dose prior to actually delivery of the therapy with the Y90, um, you may be able to improve outcomes with that. So that's a very exciting area that's you know, being investigated at MD Anderson as well as other places. And then finally, after you deliver the therapy and inject the actual Y90 um, as you know, kind of the third bullet point, um, there's a post-treatment assessment um, using you know, the, um, the tracers and seeing how much um, you know, response you have as well as where the tracer um, you know, had gone. So these are all the things that are incorporated into the Y90 assessment and delivery. So what are some of the results with both external beam radiation and Y90? Well, first of all, whenever we think about localized treatments, whether it's with external beam or with Y90, we have to think about why are we actually doing this? Um, one of the reasons that we investigated this and we're so, to, so excited about delivering these really ultra high doses of radiation is that we looked at our um, you know, patient series over the past two decades at MD Anderson. This was a, a publication in JCO by Ron Tao as well as Chris Crane from our institution um, where they looked at the cause of death for patients. And what they saw was that about two thirds of patients died because of either biliary complications or vascular complications as a direct mechanical or invasion effect of these intrahepatic cholangial carcinomas. And so they hypothesized that by achieving better local control, they might improve overall survival for these patients. And indeed, whenever they look back at the, the dose response um, you know, for patients where you know, prior to 2007, we were using kind of more antiquated old techniques of delivering standard doses of radiation 50.4 gray and 28 fractions, for example. Um, that's a moderate dose of radiation. And at, after 2007, we acquired the CT on rails and began delivering much higher doses of radiation. And then we hypothesized that that might lead to better outcomes for the patients. And indeed, you know, in that study, we saw that radiation dose was the single most important predictor of local control, as well as overall survival um, in this particular cohort. So that really led to exciting results and, you know, got us excited about being able to, you know, help extend life for patients and prolong it for them. Um, there's a phase two multi-institutional study that MD Anderson, MGH, University of Pennsylvania contributed to. Um, it included patients with both hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC, as well as those with intrahepatic glandular carcinoma. Um, so I'm showing you the results in the local control and the, the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival curves for uh, both of those groups. Um, and the intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma group, um, you know, it is um, shown where they had um, a 64% survival rate for HCC at two years and 47%, you know, overall survival rate at two years for intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. The local control rates were 94% for HCC and 91% for intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. So those results were very exciting and you know, led to important clinical trials that uh, followed up on this. And you know, really led to some change in practice um, among you know, our radiation oncologists. So what are some of the results with radioembolization for Y90? Um, these have also been you know, fairly promising. Um, what's been reported to date you know, is mostly kind of single, single center um, you know, experiences, retrospective ed evidence where they've reported rhesus responses between 15 to 36 percent, um, modified rhesus responses, which is more volumetric um, and looks at enhancements, you know, between 36 and 45 percent. And the survival results have been anywhere between nine months and 28.6 months. So there's quite a range in the, um, you know, yttrium 90 uh, literature uh, when it comes to Y90 for, um, for intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. Um, but, you know, some of these, you know, span from, you know, not very promising to, you know, somewhat encouraging. So I would say that, you know, that more investigation still needs to be done with this. And certainly um, that is being done, um, as I'll speak to in this last part of the, um, the, the, the presentation. So where are we going with these results and how do we build on that? So there's a lot of excitement about combining external beam radiation as well as Y90 with immuno-oncology or I.O. Um, this is just a schematic to show all the different interactions that happen between the immune cells as well as with the tumor cells, uh, the tumor cells being shown in the yellow there. Uh, but with all the immune cells, you know, there are multiple checkpoints. You know, these are specific molecules that, you know, can unleash the uh, immune system and really are um, usurped by tumor cells and the, um, you know, the tumor microenvironment um, to help tumors escape 
from cell kill from the immune system or surveillance from the immune system. And so by targeting specific molecules or moieties you know, on the T cells or other cells of the immune system or on the tumor cell itself, um, this you know, is one way to unleash the immune system in combination with the effects of the radiation, especially some of those bystander effects that I mentioned earlier that will allow us to enhance the radiation effects um, and potentially achieve things like the abscopal effect, you know, radiation of a single lesion in one site and then seeing a response in a distant lesion far away that was not radiated because the immune system is now primed to find it. So these are some of the things that we're excited about doing. Uh, Ted Hong, for example, at MGH and his group are looking at a combination of you know, targeting the PD-1 pathway and uh, CTLA-4 pathway um, as shown here on the picture. Um, and they're combining that with radiation. Um, so th that's one promising study that we're looking forward to seeing the results for. Um, and you know, other combination therapies have also been investigated. Um, at MD Anderson, Ong Nang in our phase one group is collaborating with myself as well as with doc Dr. Malin Javle uh, to combine radiation with in immuno-oncology agents from, uh, from Pfizer. Um, so Abelumab, um, Udomilumab, uh, which is a 41BB agent, as well as an OX40 agent you know, that they um, are also um, looking at in combination with radiation and in patients with multiple lesions. So we are radiating one lesion that we um, you know, feel can be delivered uh, safely and then measuring the effects on that lesion as well as a distant lesion that was not radiated while the patient's getting the immunotherapy. Um, so we're excited about this study and it's ongoing and we have multiple correlates built into this that allow us to investigate how the immune system is uh, responding to the radiation therapy and the systemic therapy combined. There are many frontiers with targeted agents, especially with regards to the molecular subtypes that I mentioned earlier. So FGFR genetic alterations happen between 10 and 16% of all patients. And preclinical studies suggest that whenever you target FGFR and inhibit it, there may be radiosensitization, but that depends on the specific alteration that you're dealing with. So there are some where inhibition with, of FGFR with radiation can be synergistic, but there's other situations where there may not be an effect. So we have to look at the very specific type of FGFR alteration that a patient may have uh, to, to really select and you know, use this type of combination going forward. Uh, IDH1 mutations happen, or IDH you know, mutations in general, one or two, you know, can happen in 25% of patients. Um, this may inherently be a situation where the patient's tumors are more radiation sensitive by themselves. But there is rationale to both combine radiation with DNA repair pathways in patients with IDH mutations because that may further enhance the effects of the radiation. Um, MSI high, so microsatellite instability, is a marker for patients who might be susceptible to checkpoint blockade. And that represents a little bit less than 1% of patients you know, with cholangiocarcinoma. But there may be you know, good rationale in these types of patients, even though it's a small subset, uh, to combine immuno-oncology with radiation and you know, potentially lead to abscopal effects or just better control of the tumors that um, you know, we know are there. There are multiple Y90 trials that are ongoing and completed. Um, some of them combine them with chemotherapy, such as capecitabine or gemcitabine cisplatin, you know, both of which are you know, somewhat standard you know, chemotherapy regimens. So those are um, either ongoing or have been completed and we're anxiously waiting the results for. Um, there are also some studies where they're actually instituting Y90 in the frontline setting for patients with cholangiocarcinoma that's not resectable. And you know, this is also in combination with chemotherapy such as gemcis or Y90 by itself. Um, combinations with immunotherapies as well as other targeted agents will be of great interest. There's already been some case reports of combining Y90 with um, checkpoint blockade um, and has shown some you know, very interesting results and responses. So we expect these things to come online and you know, be something that we may hopefully be able to offer to patients in the future. There's other ways that we can kind of think of these agents. You know, Y90 and radiation are both forms of radiation, but they may not necessarily um, act the same way. And there may be rationale to combine them, especially for patients with multifocal disease, where say you have a very large dominant lesion that Y90 may not be able to completely encompass, um, but external beam radiation may be able to. 
but then there may be satellite lesions off the, off to the side that may be too big or too wide for the external beam radiation field to be able to encompass safely, but we could treat with Y90 you know, in, a, in a very targeted manner. So this is the rationale for potentially combining that. And we are actually investigating this through a prospective trial that I'm the PI for, where we have multiple different cohorts where, you know, cohort one has advanced cirrhosis, cohort two are patients who had prior liver toxic therapies, um, such as oxaliplatin or uh, renotecan or prior liver resection. And then fi finally, patients um, who have received prior radiation, whether with Y90 or external beam radiation, you know, can also be enrolled onto the study where we're using functional image guidance to be able to see where the healthy liver is residing and then target you know, the dominant lesions that need to um, achieve better local control and hopefully extend the life of these patients. So there are rationales and reasons to try to combine these. And these are other types of uh, clinical trials that we can expect to look, at, look to in the future. Um, I mentioned that, you know, Electa have a sponsored research agreement with them, you know, to, to investigate motion management for patients with pancreatic cancer. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with liver tumors for, uh, for, uh, for the time being, but, you know, potentially could be extended to them. Um, you know, just for the sake of, you know, um, balance, you know, I also mentioned that, you know, Vuray is another MRI-based, you know, guidance company that delivers radiation therapy as well. Um, so this is another type of platform for radiation therapy that may enable us to deliver these high doses very safely, um, you know, by, uh, you know, using these image guided technologies that are incorporated into the linear accelerator. So this is a new advanced technique of delivering radiation that we're excited about also. So finally, to summarize, you know, ablative radiation doses um, can substantially prolong survival for patients with locally advanced intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Many patients die of tumor-related liver failure and a multimodality approach, you know, with imaging, radiation oncology, interventional radiation oncology, systemic therapy, and, you know, potentially other surgical interventions may help to extend patient survival through better local control. Um, highly conformal therapies, image guidance, and motion management are important components of the external beam technique. Um, and Y90 is also a, a multimodality technique where, you know, quality assurance and making sure that the dose that we know that we're giving to the tumor is critical. Um, so those are things that are ongoing and you know, we ex we're excited to see the research come out of that. Um, combination therapies with radiation, whether it's with external beam or with Y90 may lead to new indications uh, to give radiation for our patients with this disease. So I wanna thank you again uh, for your time and for the, um, you know, the attention. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all of our four sources of funding um, all of the collaborators, you know, Malin Javle, Stacey Lindsay, Larry Kwong, Ong Nang, um, multiple others from the MD Anderson group that I've listed here, um, the Clangio Carcinoma Foundation, as well as ICRN. I, I want to thank you all for everything that you've provided to me, as well as our group to move the field forward. I'll leave, um, you know, by just ending and saying that I'm very happy to answer questions. You know, my email is uh, listed here um, and feel, please feel free to, to reach out to me if anything arises. Thank you very much again. Um, have a nice day. So good evening. Um, I'm, um, I'm John Primrose. I'm hold the chair of surgery in Southampton in the UK. And I'm going to uh, moderate this uh, question uh, session. Um, first, I'm really grateful to the foundation for managing to get this together in these difficult times. Uh, it's been a fantastic meeting. This has been a really uh, great uh, session. So uh, if we just um, start to deal with uh, some of the, the some of the questions, um, Heinz, the, 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 you, you talked about induction chemotherapy but chemo uh, chemo th induction therapy but i'm not sure absolutely uh everybody was totally on board with what that is do you want to do you want to try and explain that a bit more sure thanks uh, thank you john um so for patients who uh, where the local well the disease is locally advanced so an operation is not an option um, um, induction means that you try to reduce the, uh, the load of disease locally to be able to perform a operation um, after uh, systemic treatment, for example. So induction to therapy means you want to achieve a goal later if you cannot achieve it now. 
Sure. And if if we're if we're talking about induction chemo rads, and maybe Eugene can comment on this uh, as well, is is that intended? We we know that relapse is is related to margins and it's related to lymph nodes. I mean, is that is that is it feasible to do chemo rad in this setting? Do you think? It, it is. Um, you know the. The, the liver is a, a unique area of the body, um, you know, surrounded by bowel, you know, and other structures um, that can make it challenging for, you know, surgeons to resect after, you know, a radiate, you know, within a radiated field. Um, so there is some, you know, differences in practice patterns, you know, around the world in that regard. Um, you know, there are some for example, in Japan, um, who will do preoperative radiation, you know, um, pretty standardly, um, you know, to try to downstage disease um, and, and try to resect it. Um, you know, there's also a protocol that came out of Mayo Clinic, um, you know, that was done preoperative chemo radiation for hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, um, you know, prior to transplant, and that also showed some very encouraging results. So there, there is a role that radiation may play in those um, types of settings. Um, you know, it's not standard, however. Thanks. Any comments? Yeah, no. I, look, for local recurrences, of course, chemo radiation uh, might be more effective. What we don't know is if we will increase the uh, uh, radical resection rate. Um, so that, that needs to be uh, studied. Uh, so our approach uh, is now to give chemotherapy alone because chemo radiation is not standard of care. But I think sure. it is a field um, which should be um, looked at it as well. So one of what it seems to be one of the problems, particularly in treating perihyalur disease with neoadjuvant therapy, is um, the, the the sepsis uh, sepsis issue. Uh, I mean, I I have one hot, one patient in ITU here with a drained cholangio who has come in with very profound sepsis, and he's not even had chemotherapy. So, I mean, how are you going to get around this? I presume you'd have to you have to ensure all the liver is drained. Sure. So that is, of course, a big problem. So a lot of patients um, are having so many problems with their bile ducts and infections, and um, that that treatment of the cancer um, is a is a problem. That's, of course, what Eugene also highlighted. Uh, in the slides of his retrospective analysis, the cause of um, death for patients is uh, is not the cancer itself, uh, but the problems uh, occurring because of the cancer locally. Uh, so that is a problem. But what we try to achieve is for the patients where we can save, uh, who are in a safe situation, to achieve more for those patients. But that's unfortunately not the largest group of patients. We re do realize that. And it would be fantastic if radiation would keep the area more um, safe, let's say. But I'm not quite sure what Eugene uh, thinks about that. Yeah, we, we've, 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 we've yeah for perihyalur disease, you know, we, we've you know, you know, Malin Javle sees a lot of the patients and refers them to us. Um, oftentimes, you know, when they have locally advanced unresectable disease and are having recurrent bouts of cholangitis. Um, you know, we, we haven't, you know, finalized our, you know, retrospective analysis of this, but at least anecdotally, you know, the radiation does seem to help whenever patients are having those sorts of situations with recurrent bouts of cholangitis and obstruction. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the data need to be reviewed and, you know, vetted, but um, that, that's at least been our experience. Okay. So the, the other two... thing is, sorry, go on. Go on. The, the other option, of course, uh, because stenting is, of course, something we need to do for the perihyalur uh, cholangica sinoma patients. And um, some of their aims are to have a more uh, patent uh, stenting. And that in, in that way that you might um, add either radiation or RFA or something of local treatment to have patients um, uh, with less obstruction in that area. Okay. So maybe we, we maybe move on just to talk about a couple of things that have come up in questions that, that haven't really been covered. Um, and one is IRE and the other is, is high PEC for peritoneal disease. 
which I have to say I've never, never, I'm not aware of having been done in glandiocarcinoma. Uh, I don't know if that is that is that correct, Laura? Would you? Are you I, I'm no. not sure if you're an expert in this field, but it, it's not um, it's not something uh, we're familiar with. No, we're a high pec institution, but we don't um, do it for that indication. I think um, uh, I, I think high pec has its own sets of controversies, even in the in the best of settings where there may be some suggestion ac activity. Um, but hasn't been explored in in um, in cholangiocarcinoma uh, peritoneal metastasis. I think it would have to be a very um, select patient. IPAC really um, requires a relatively indolent um, uh, pattern of, of disease spread, and so there may be a, a super select patient that that could be considered. But that would be done in conjunction with an experienced IPAC surgeon, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think the, the the disease you get tends to be quite hard and fibrous, and it's it's not like the disease we're often you, treating with high peck and colorectal cancer. So let, let's just dump, let's just park that one. Um, IRE, I, I have to say, I'm not a fan, but uh, Heinz, you are a fan. Uh, any comments <laughs> on it, where it fits? Well, we have tried this um, in a group of patients with uh, uh, locally advanced perihyalar cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, the results will be presented, so I cannot go into details. Um, but, um, well, it does not look too bad, I have to say. Um, so the complication rate is very low, and that is, um, that's what I can tell you already. Um, uh, but, of course, the question is, um, is that what, what does it mean for that group of pa uh, patients? Because most people, uh, patients will have advanced disease or metastatic disease later on. But the local control, as Eugene pointed out, is a very important goal in the treatment of perihyalar cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, uh, so th just a couple of questions like chemotherapy. Where do PARP inhibitors currently fit into the, the, uh, the frame, Laura? Or, or rather, maybe the bucket would be a better way of putting it. <laughs> well, yeah, so I think that um, one of the points is that I think the buckets can be fairly fluid. And so um, <laughs> if for some for some of uh, our agents, and PARP inhibitors are a perfect example of this. So um, are PARP inhibitors a targeted therapy, or um, may they um, be useful for, quote, all comers? Um, you know, there, we definitely um, know that with um, certain subsets um, like BRCA mutation and, and other um, kind of um, highly susceptible groups, um, it, they function more like a targeted therapy, whereas with high um, rates of response. However, they may have activity that's a little bit more broad akin to a, to a chemotherapy agent. I mean, all chemotherapy in some ways has some sort of target. It's just whether or not that's unique to the cancer cell um, and, and, and closer to a one-to-one -one ratio of drug to cancer. Um, and so um, PARP inhibitors, uh, you know, probably have high rates of response in, in select subsets and may have a role uh, more broadly somewhat because there are kind of um, a broader range of, of uh, unidentified or, or um, wider range of, uh, of alterations that convey susceptibility and especially either in combination with chemotherapy or more intri intriguingly potentially with uh, immunotherapy. So um, there are uh, combinations in advanced disease, and as I alluded to in our in a kind of our maintenance, the idea is that is that going to be one way to unmask um, uh, additional uh, antigens um, and create susceptibility or sensitivity um, to cholangiocarcinoma cells to um, immune therapy. Okay. So it's sort of in multiple buckets. Multiple, okay, multiple buckets. Now, it, there's a question about fall fox and uh, whether it works in in uh, situations where uh, gem cis hasn't. But I mean, I, I guess you'd refer to the UK trial, which was second line. But I guess the same applies. 
Right, and I, I haven't seen that particular analysis of, um, um, of uh, related to how patients did in the in the first line setting in gemsis, and if 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 it was only folks who had initially a, a prolonged response to gemsis who also had a response yeah. to full fox, and I don't know if I you are pretty know additional yeah. data than I, I am. I do know. I do know. It's, it doesn't matter. So both patients who did respond or did not respond were responding okay. to full fox. Great. Um, uh, so so there's there's the answer. You That's know, I think. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I think we'll leave that. Yeah. And s somebody asked uh, what uh, did, what single point checkpoint inhibition is. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, there's no telling what I actually said, but what I meant was single agent checkpoint inhibitor. So referring right. to drugs like yeah. um, pembrolizumab alone or nivolumab alone, um, where in a lot of cancers, not all, but a lot of cancers, the rates of response may be in the 15 to 20% range. Um, and for some reason, in biliary cancers, the rates hover closer to the 5% range um, for the larger studies. And so um, generally, the response rates in this disease are lower than they seem to be in all comers and other diseases. And, and I think um, that leads us to really not know how what is the best direction for us to go for immunotherapy? Um, you know, in some diseases, the rates of, of, of using those drugs are high enough to justify kind of um, uh, a trial of immunotherapy or trial of, of, of a checkpoint inhibitor um, for patients um, who progressed. And in, in this disease, I think it's, it's much more questionable because these are drugs that really can have very serious consequences. And without having uh, an enriched population, um, really for the most part, um, we don't know how to use yet. Okay. So can we maybe move on to a bit more about the radio, radiation therapies? I mean, the, Proton proton uh, treatments have been very topical, but um, I guess the question we've got to ask is, you know, what where is the evidence of benefit? Do you want to deal with that, Eugene? Yeah. So I think the the strongest you know evidence you know is in our phase two multi center study you know with uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard, uh, UPenn, and MD Anderson. Um, in that study, we treated. Um, 79 patients, um, about half of whom had intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and we treated them using a 15 fraction regimen that had been, you know, established in a phase one earlier study, um, and you know was giving you know doses between 58.05 gray in 15 fractions up to 67.5 gray in 15 fractions, uh, all using protons. Um, and in that study, you know, we observed um, you know greater than 90 percent local control at two years. Um, and then also saw survival rates at, at two years that were comparable to some surgical series. Um, you know, the, the, those results were, were quite encouraging and led to a phase three randomized study. Unfortunately, that study was not um, able to accrue anybody because it was a randomized study between doing chemotherapy alone and then doing you know, chemotherapy followed by radiation. And no one really wanted to be randomized in that way, given the results, the striking results that we saw with that proton sure. study that we published. Um, so, you know, now, you know, MD Anderson has, you know, kind of adopted, you know, uh, you know, radiation as, you know, a, a consolidation treatment after chemotherapy and, you know, demonstration of at least some stable disease uh, for patients, um, you know, after a few months, to, you know, between two to six months of chemotherapy, um, you know, and, you know, we often actually even do radiation, you know, extend those results to patients where we see, you know, advanced disease, especially centrally located where, we anticipate that the patients are going to run into problems with either vascular complications or with biliary complications or both. Um, and in those situations, you know, as, as Heinz was mentioning, you know, local control is paramount, you know, to try to prevent, you know, tumor related liver failure. Um, so we, we, we have extended, you know, those results beyond, you know, just the proton study and, you know, are, are using, you know, you know, kind of an individualized approach to the patients these days. Um, we, we continue to in investigate, you know, how we can improve our techniques and then also how we might uh, combine them, you know, with targeted therapies, as I mentioned in the presentation. Okay. 
Okay. Now, I would love to go on for longer, but the plug is about to be pulled on this. So, um, so can I just thank everybody for some really fantastic talks? I've certainly uh, learned a lot. And uh, thanks again to the Andrew Carson Foundation for putting on such a great meeting. So, uh, goodbye, everybody. From the UK, here. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>